Good morning, everybody. It's Sandra here at Huron Ridge Greenhouses. Uh, the Friday of the long weekend, although as I chatted about earlier, it seems like we've been in a weekend mode for quite some time. Uh, work schedules are completely off these days, but regardless, it is the May long weekend and it's rainy today, but surprisingly warm and they're calling for a beautiful day tomorrow. So unusual for the May long weekend to have any decent weather, but we'll take what we can get for sure. So um, I personally posted to my Facebook page earlier this week that I was looking for gardening questions because I find that a lot of my knowledge is just kind of there and I don't really think about how um, that I know maybe things that the rest of you aren't sure about. So I put it out there and I had over a hundred comments on my Facebook page, on my personal profile of people with gardening questions. So I was a little overwhelmed. Um, I certainly can't answer them all in this little 10 minute video, but we're gonna give it a start. So um, I've got a list of some things I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I thought, well, this is a ten generally a prime weekend for vegetable gardening. Uh, let's start with some vegetable gardening questions. And I thought we're going to start from the ground up because Janet asked me um, what to do to get her soil in better condition. I actually took a little video at home last night. So if you just bear with me, I'll play that one second. I think this is the one I want. Hey there, so I had somebody send me a question about soil and how you can make your soil better. It's something that I have struggled with in this particular flower bed since we got here in 2006. So it's been a while, it's been a battle. Um, this wasn't even a flower bed when we got here, it was just kind of a grassed area and that had been a flower bed at one time but had fallen into neglect. So it needed a lot of work when we got here. Um, we have put in a brick wall, did all kinds of things in this area. So the, the ground here has been trampled a lot and it was pretty heavy ground to begin with. So generally in the spring, uh, when I go to work it, this is a perennial bed, so I'm always working around my perennials. I find it has a lot of clumps in it, um, and I'll just try to break them up as good as I can. And then I will always um, add some peat moss, as well as some composted manure, and that definitely helps over time. Uh, the other thing that we have actually done is we've taken wheelbarrows of this heavy, bad soil out, and worked in some uh, pro mix a few times to try to help. Um, and it's just a gradual process. It's something that I don't feel like I can do all in one year. It's gonna take some time to get that soil quality up. But don't, uh, don't quit, just keep trying and it'll get better over time. So that gives you a little bit of uh, view into my yard, uh, <laughs> working at my perennial bed. Same goes for your vegetable garden. Um, amending your soil is always a positive, uh, especially, uh, yeah, because your vegetables take the nutrients out of the soil every year and then you eat them. So you have to keep adding more nutrients into your soil. There's various ways to do that. Like I said in the video, uh, composted manure is a great way. We have sheet manure here by the bag. If you, uh, there's also a pelletized hen manure that we carry here as well. That's an organic product. And if you want to, you can also add in um, a commercial kind of fertilizer like this one. I've grabbed this one, classic coat. Uh, this is a slow release fertilizer. It's granular. You sprinkle it on the soil and it just adds nutrients back into your soil. So there's lots of different ways to go about doing that. Um, and as I talked about in the video, it depends really on what you're working with to begin with. If your soil's heavy, then you want to add some peat moss. Peat moss. <laughs> if it's really um, sandy, you're going to want to add more compost as far as um, if you save your potato peels and food waste, like, like um, vegetable food waste, you can compost it and work it back into your garden. So that's something to consider. Um, lots of great ways to add to your soil. So that's the ground that we're going to start with. Um, then Kate asked me what are the easiest vegetables to grow and I kind of struggled with this one because I find all vegetables easy to grow but that's probably not a good answer. Um, potatoes I find super easy. You throw them in the ground they grow. You have to hill them when they start to sprout. Other than that they pretty much take care of themselves. Green beans I find easy to grow. They, they germinate pretty quickly. You know for sure that they are coming up um, and of course I find a tomato easy to grow. Biggest thing is you're gonna to have to keep ahead of the weeds and make sure you give them some water. So those are your, when you get your vegetable garden growing, those are definitely things to consider. Um, Caroline asked me how to harvest what she's already got planted, as in lettuce, spinach, all of those things. So if you've planted some early season green leafy things, um, you can just really, don't take them right off at the root, but you can cut with just a pair of scissors, cut very close to the bottom. And as long as it's a leafy veg, like a leaf lettuce, not a head lettuce. So if you've grown romaine or bib lettuce or iceberg lettuce, those aren't gonna regrow the same way. But leaf lettuce or spinach are all gonna regrow from the bottom up. So don't be afraid to just start cutting and eating them. We've been harvesting lettuce for about a week now out of my little garden box and spinach as well. It's really quite simple and it's already starting to grow back. Once you get your crop established, 
you'll be hard pressed to eat as much as you can harvest is my guess. Um, I tend to not harvest it too much ahead because I find it stays nicer in the garden. If it gets to be really warm out, you know how lettuce and stuff can go kind of limp outside, I would probably bring it in, wash it and chill it maybe overnight or even just for the afternoon before dinner. Um, but definitely it, it's best in the ground until you're ready to eat it pretty much because as soon as you start cutting it, it's, just, it's not gonna have the lasting power. So that's uh, one suggestion there. Um, give me one second here. Okay, hold on, there we go. Okay. Um, Sarah asked me about varieties of tomatoes. What are the oldest varieties? How tomatoes have changed? Um, and things like that. So our standard varieties of tomatoes, we grow into three packs. The hybrid varieties and heirloom tomatoes, we grow in four inch pots. So I'm actually in the four inch pot section. Um, a standard tomato doesn't really look any different than a hybrid tomato. But it is different in that the, the seed producers have crossbred one two, three different kinds, I, I'm not exactly sure, but they've crossbred different kinds of plants through pollination in order to get a hybrid tomato. Now, somebody asked me, does hybrid the same as a GMO? Absolutely not. People have been making hybrid plants for ge generations, long before GMO even existed. So hybrid is um, perfectly fine, safe to eat, great, you've been doing it your whole life and just didn't know. Um, but um, a hybrid tomato is a, probably a stronger plant. So they breed them to increase productivity and to increase the quality of the plant. So uh, this one is a Mountain Fresh Plus, uh, which brings me to my next question by Jim was how do you prevent tomato blight? Tomato blight, I've talked about this a few times. Tomato blight, if you've had it, you know because you have beautiful big plants till late July, they're full of green tomatoes, and then seemingly overnight they die. The plants turn black, the tomatoes get rotten looking, and it's really, really sad because you've got a beautiful crop of tomatoes and then all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. So, Mountain Fresh tomatoes, the Mountain series of tomatoes, so there's Mountain Fresh, Mountain Glory, Mount, we've got a few. So, the Mountain series are late blight resistant. Doesn't mean it, you can't be affected, but it does mean that they've got a better chance of fighting that blight. So um, definitely something to consider. I always pop one of these in my garden, partly because I love the fruit it produces, but it also gives me that little bit of assurance because I have had problems with tomato blight in the past, which was what Jim asked me about. He asked about preventing tomato blight. And the other thing I told him is you need to spray with copper. So, oh, I just dropped my book in a puddle. Okay, uh, you need to spray with copper sulfate as a preventative, okay? So once you've got tomato blight, you're kind of, it's, it's over. Game, game over, wait till next year to start planting new tomatoes. But copper sulfate you can spray on in advance and it'll help to prevent it. So copper sulfate was actually, it sometimes is called, oh, there's a name for it and it's a French name. Oh, it's out of my mind now. Maybe one of you watching out there will remember it. Um, but it was developed by monks in France years ago to prevent um, blight from their grapevines. What the heck's it called? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, you, it, it is copper sulfate. It's a natural product. Uh, you dilute it in water. You spray it on your tomato plants. I do mine. I pick a day of the week. So maybe it's uh, Monday and I spray every Monday. Um, or if there's a heavy rain and it washes it all off, I'll respray. But you start that usually around the first week of July, and you can spray every week, well, until you're done harvesting, till uh, end of September, anyways. Um, and it will help to prevent um, tomato blight. So that's a really important thing if you've struggled with tomato blight. The other part of that, I didn't write down who asked me, but I know somebody asked me about crop rotation. Maybe it was Janet. Um, Definitely, if you've had tomato blight, you cannot plant the tomatoes in the same spot you had them last year where the tomato blight was because the blight spores actually get in the ground and you'll just continue to have the same problem over and over and over again. So if you've had tomato blight, move your tomatoes and make sure that you, I would say, buy a tomato that's got some blight resistance built into the genetics of it and spray with uh, copper sulfate and it'll make a huge difference in what you get to harvest this year. Um, yeah, I had one year for sure where I don't think I harvested any tomatoes, so that was a very sad year. And since then, I've been much more diligent in my care of them and, uh, yeah, have had no real issues since. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, and before I wrap up today, because I'm trying to keep things to 10 minutes, um, Lynn asked me about tomato bugs. Well, the, the easiest, easy, well, easiest, I don't know. One way to do it is to pick them off and kill them. Uh, they get they get pretty big. They're kind of gnarly looking. Um, when I was when I had little boys, I used to pay them a quarter for every tomato bug they killed. So if you've got little boys, 
it's kind of a fun activity for them. Um, if you don't, and you're too grossed out to pull them off yourself, we have um, this BTK, which is an insecticide. Again, it, you can uh, uh, spray it on, and it helps to control caterpillars. Uh, really, no, um, it, yeah, it works. That's all I can say. It does a great job. So if you don't, if you've got tomato bugs or bugs in other things, this is a good all-around use. Controls caterpillars, including cabbage worm, tomato, hornworm, tent caterpillars, gypsy moth, leaf rollers, and some other insects. So a great product that we have here. Um, other than that, uh, Jody wanted to know how I have got such great asparagus and spinach already. Spinach I planted in mid-March, so that was definitely part of the secret, Jody, and uh, kept it under my little cold frame cover, so it had a lot of protection during these last few weeks when it's been so stinking cold. Um, and for the asparagus, it's a really established patch. My patch of asparagus is so oh, 12, 10, 12 years old, so that's part of it. And the other part of it is we do fertilize. So uh, slow-release fertilizer, I think... I can't remember if we, my husband Chris usually takes care of it. I think he fertilized last fall and probably again really early in the spring. And um, other than that, it's pretty much takes care of itself. And he spends a lot of time weeding actually. He's a very uh, diligent gardener. And last year he went through the asparagus patch and it's not easy to weed asparagus in an established patch because the roots are so intertwined. But he did, uh, actually I think he used a screwdriver or something like that to dig a lot of the roots of the weeds out. So kudos to him that we've got a great asparagus patch this spring. Um, other than that, I do have a whole list of other questions that have been sent to me. But like I said, trying to keep this to 10 to 12 minutes. So our time is just about up for the day. We are open this weekend from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. Curbside pickup is still available for online ordering. People have asked if we're running out of things. It's kind of a yes, no answer. There's some specific things that we're running low on, but the greenhouse is still full. We still have tomato plants. We still have pepper plants. Um, there's, I think, ghost peppers we're out of. There's a few odd things that we are out of, and there's no more coming, but we still are planting more tomatoes too. So if you are more of a late season gardener, we're gonna be able to take care of you as well, we hope. And other than that, have a great holiday weekend. The weather tomorrow sounds very promising. So we hope you get outside and enjoy some sunshine. And other than that, have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.